Hey guys, welcome again to one of my videos. Um, I decided to redo my guide that I uploaded today. I saw in the comments that many people had some open questions that I wanted to address and I also changed my mind on one rune after doing some extensive testing. So uh, please enjoy the video and uh, have a great day. Hey guys, what's up? Uh, it's Listery again. And today I'm bringing you my guide for phase three, Soul Link Warlock in PvP scenarios. So I'm running around Fellwood, uh, farming some satyrs here, and uh, I decided to run my Soul Link PvP build as usual, because on PvP realms you're going to encounter a lot of PvP. In general, Soul Link is a extremely powerful spec of this season. Uh, I would say it's S tier and probably the best spec there is. I haven't come across any class who has a fair chance of beating me in 1v1. Now, obviously, there are going to be better players than you, but um, provided the skill cap is similar, and it's not top 0.001% of world players, but it's actually average players or slightly above average players, then you will see that Soul Link is super, super powerful just by the raw stats alone. And by raw stats, I mean the HP pool, the damage via dots, and the 30% damage reduction that you have. So what does that mean? It means 31 in Demonology, the same talents as before, nothing has changed here. And in the Affliction Tree, we finally get to spend 10 points. I have Instant Corruption, I have 3 in Suppression, which helps us with Spell Hit and with, uh, therefore, the Resists. And uh, we have 2 in Improved Life Tap to give us a little bit more sustain and a little bit of a bigger overall HP mana pool. Um, now, regarding runes, I am running the Felguard rune. As you can see here, the Felguard. I will be explaining to you a little bit about why I choose this. First of all, Felguard is strong because we are getting four Master Demonologist buffs. The threat you can completely ignore. The 50 to all res is still good. It increases the chance we will resist any spells. 10% uh, increased damage, awesome, goes without saying. And 10% reduced physical damage, also very nice as a caster to be less squishy. So these buffs alone could make an argument that for general open world PvP you should use a Felguard. But the next best thing actually I want to talk about is the charge, or the intercept, let's say. Um, the intercept is a real nice tool. Um, you could even opt to leave it on autocast, but it's much better if you can cast it manually. And the reason it's so good is when you run around open world and people are on the mount, then always it's a very good tool to just charge them and while they're stunned, you can actually get a fear off. And that's exactly what happens to this pala. Disregard the drain life. I charge him. While he's in charge stun, I um, fear him and apply full dots. Now, the drain life in the, in the beginning was a fat finger. Uh, <laughs> but you, as you can see, it works. Or you just do this the other way around. If you do manage to get a fear off on your opponent and you decide to dot him, because in such cases, I never cast haunt, because haunt has a very high chance of breaking a fear. Uh, much higher than if you just apply Corruption and Agony. So usually when I fear someone first, I apply Corruption and Agony. And then I will charge the moment I launch the Haunt, and then I'll press the Drain Life. This means basically that you could, while the guy is in the charge stun, you could apply a new fear. So this is another gameplay um, advice why uh, Fel Felguard has some value in open world scenarios. And while I am uh, focusing these demons, just farming some shards, I do get opened by the same feral we just tried to kill. Um, I dot him, I charge him, the grenade is not needed at all, but the charge did go off. I did get the fear in the charge, and I just killed him. Now, I don't want to dis dis um, disregard the fell hunter, because uh, it is the strongest pet for pure PvP scenarios. Um, the damage of the Felguard doesn't really matter, and the Fell Hunter, what it has is the Dispel and the Spell Lock, which are just amazing. And in real PvP situations, such as Arena, or such as some kind of a tournament, or, or anything else, duels for gold or whatever, depending on the match matchup, of course, I would always be using the Fell Hunter and recommending to use the Fell Hunter. However, if you like to have a little bit of fun with the Felguard, as I do, it's also a solid choice. I'm going to take care of this Warlock while I explain what I'm going to go over. So as you can see, I'm running Unstable Affliction right now. Um, the reason is I wanted to show um, how it's working. And basically, you can see I just fully dotted this guy and killed him. And now we're going to go into the details and we're going to note that actually Unstable Affliction did decent damage. 
Now, one might ask themselves, why should it not do decent damage? Well, the past week the Warlock Discord has been uh, covered with one topic, Haunt not applying the 20% extra damage buff to UA. And this has been correct. However, here are the good news, Blizzard hotfixed this today. Um, and whoever doesn't believe me, I'll show it to you. I'm glad to show it. So I'm going to haunt this guy right here. And now I'm casting Unstable Affliction. Now the first tick is including haunt. It's a 156 damage. Next one the same. Now haunt fell off. And it's just 131. So you do see that the 20% buff is actually in the game. Which actually makes UA um, a lot more viable than it was yesterday. Um, now, the biggest reason why I'm currently not running it is for me, UA is an ability for group content. It is incredibly strong when the enemy has healers that can dispel and you want to get your dots up, your drain life, your haunt and don't have it dispelled. So in BGs, one could make a case that it's for sure better, especially if you're trying to do some uh, dot spread pressure. However, um, as we all know, Season of Discovery has been more the bursty meta side, um, so I'm not sure how good um, uh, dot kind of builds or multi-dot builds in BGs actually perform. As, in my opinion, Warlock in BGs is more of a utility class in Season of Discovery, meaning we are strong in 1v1 as a soul link and we can provide, yeah, Curse of Tongues, we can provide Fears, all of these kind of things, usually dispels and counterspells, in this case, probably um, charges of your pet. So, um, yeah, I'm not 100% certain that the spread dot tactic will work, but in general, uh, UA will be good in group content and in some certain 1v1 matchups in which dispel protection will help, for example, against Priest. And also then we would like to be running Fell Hunter anyway, which of course means we switch to the UA rune. Next up, I would like to talk to you guys about Demonic Grace. The Demonic Grace rune is a rune I'd been running in P1 and P2 in my PvP setup due to the fact that I loved the dodge and due to the fact that I wasn't going getting a big value out of the other runes uh, in my personal playstyle. Obviously, the dodge is still very strong, the critical strike is as well, but as you all know, it's on the global cooldown, which makes it a lot weaker. It cannot be used like a trinket. But instead it must be cast and then you have to wait for the global cooldown to finish. Now, this is a viable tactic to take it. And if, for example, we can be stationary, like right here, and we use it, we can cast after the global cooldown expires. We cast UA, we cast Corruption, and we cast Curse of Agony. Now it expires, but you see they are critting a lot because I have 30% additional crit. So we are 37 crit here on this snapshot. Because it's snapshots, so it means that all of the ticks now will have a 37% crit chance, which is a big, big damage. So this is a very, very viable tactic. Going to the next slot, okay, obviously Pandemic on the head slot, uh, Master Channeler still on the chest, Haunt, uh, Grimoire of Synergy, which actually procs a lot when you send the Felguard into attack a lot. Um, I went for Demonic Pact now on legs because it is actually quite nice to get this 30 extra spell power is about what it gets. And since my guy is attacking so much and he's critting more often, so I'm actually getting decent procs here. I mean, you can still run Demonic Grace, but at this point I just prefer the Demonic Pact. It, but this is more a matter of preference. And on the boots, obviously I'm running still the Demonic Knowledge. So much for the runes, guys. Looking at my gear, um, I already showed it. I have the, I'm running more or less the setup that I plan to use even after raid gear. So I was fortunate enough to get quite some good uh, drops already or quite some, acquire quite some good items. I got the green lens of Shadow Wrath engineering item without a say. You must be engineer if you take PvP seriously. Still got the Nomer necklace, which I'm looking to replace for the raid one now in the Sunken Temple. I got the three-piece PvP set, the mantle, the gloves, and the leggings, which all I already uh, enchanted, and uh, which makes sense. You need to grab this three-piece because you get 15 stamina. It makes a lot of sense. Now, one could opt to take the raid leggings, which is pretty good, the tank one, the nightmare one, um, which beats this one in stats completely. But uh, then the I issue is that you have to take the, the boots of the PvP set, and they really suck, let's say. The hit doesn't provide any value. The stamina and spell damage is quite low. The Arati Basin boots are m a much, much better choice. As you can see, they have the move speed uh, already on the item itself so you get to enchant seven stamina you so you have a massive 20 stamina 
and nine um, spell damage on it. But one thing I'm actually thinking about changing is I think I am going to swap to um, to a another item. I think I'm going to probably swap to the raid boots these here. Now, if you compare that, basically you get on the defilers you get 20 stem, nine spell damage, and on the nightmares you get 11 stem and a 20 spell damage. So. I still run the philosophy that spell damage is slightly worth more than stamina, so I am thinking about switching those uh, once I get a token that I can spare for this PvP item. I'm talking about the remainder of the items for the chest slot. I, do cho I did choose the class quest one. Um, you could run a bit different setup, but I prefer this one because actually it has very nice stamina on it and it has 23 spell damage. And there's no item really that I, that I compare with that. One could go with the raid um, chest piece since uh, it has uh, it has one percent crit and the same spell damage, but you would lose some stamina. So I'm not going to do that. And the nightmarish ones, I mean, they have less spell damage. The hit is of no value. They have less stamina. They have no int. They only have more armor, and that's clearly not a trade we like to take. So. On the uh, bracer slot, there's only one. You you got to be an engineer. You got to make these bracers because they are very strong. They're even stronger than the Warsong Exalted ones. Plus, they have the effect breaking the fear. Um, as a weapon, I choose the Soul Harvester. Obviously, this item is not bis, but it looks the best. So that's why I went for this. And uh, I just like the undead style of having this nice little scythe. Uh, by the way, you can get the Battle Tower of the Defilers now. Uh, Blizzard changed it on 6th of April. They changed the quest. Once you get exalted, the Tower quest now is level 50 instead of level 60. On the belt slot, I mean, you could argue as well uh, to use the Defilers one, but uh, in my opinion, this Court of the Untamed is actually bis. It has more stamina, more, more spell damage. As I said, the hit is not really necessary or doesn't provide any value except against priests who have a high chance to resist, but um, I'm running with this one for sure. Overall, I think it's the best. Now on ring slots, I think it's also a very obvious choice. I'm running for the Stranglethorn Veil event, um, Eye of the Blood Moon. And the other ring, I am running the Exalted Emerald Wardens one. Um, now, some people may not like the proc. I love it, because if I were to swap this out with Underworld Band, it would be 14 spell damage. With this ring, I actually get 66. And basically, if this procs, then I immediately reapply Corruption or, or cast a Drain Life, because all those abilities scale fairly well with spell damage. So it's pretty good. Um, going to the Trinket slots, obviously the PvP Trinket, and I'm going for Torment. Now the Torment, I made a separate video. It's a little proc effect that happens once you apply a dot or a damage source. It will cause the enemy to wander for three seconds. This does not break on damage. So even the fell guard can be hitting the enemy and he still keeps wandering. So it's a very, very nice effect. It's very powerful in PvP. It's just very, very much RNG because you have no idea when it will ever proc. So if you prefer just to have flat damage or flat stamina, there are other options as well. Today I've been roaming around in Felwood a little bit to, uh, yeah, basically just farm the people that are trying to quest there. Bam, one shot. Let's talk about the professions. Um, the reason I didn't mention the, um, the tailoring uh, shoulders in my gear guide is because I'm not a tailor anymore. I switched professions, I went away from uh, from tailoring, and now I actually leveled, you guessed it, enchanting. Um, now why did I do that? Well, if you look at the stats, um, these shoulders would give me a bit more stats and a bit more spell damage. But we're talking 5 spell damage, 4 stamina, 4 int, and we lose 1% cr crit. So actually, it's the, the tailoring ones are slightly better, but not much better. Now, what do I get as an enchanter? I get this. Enchanted Sigil Living Dreams. Increases spell damage by 50. Yup, you heard right, 50. Now, obviously, the downside of this is it doesn't persist through death, meaning in BGs, it's not viable at all. <clears throat> Once you die, it's gone. You cannot reapply it um, until the 30-minute cooldown expires, and it's fairly expensive. I think one usage of this, as of the material cost this morning, costs about 9G on my server. 
So it's not cheap, and but it will be cheaper. It will be cheaper for sure, and I'm usually running this in open world. Um, but even if you're just running the smaller version from phase two, it's an additional 20 spell damage. I would always prefer having 20 spell damage over this difference between the shoulder and this. In my opinion, they completely fail tuned this tailoring shoulder. It should be much better. Or you should be able to get this additional proc effect also outside in the world. Because if, if it's just in the sunken temple, it's just not worth it for PvP situations. Now on the next clip, I am fighting a paladin and I actually decide to fear first while he's still on the mount. This always bears the risk that when the fear breaks, he just rides off while I'm dismounted. So I try to use the Felguard here to charge him, and here I could have re-feared, but I decide to apply full dots, uh, hoping he will die from it. But actually it turns out this Paladin is not as squishy as suspected, and there comes a mage. Very low HP, usually not an issue, but I first thought about chasing the Paladin, then I went for the mage, he blocked my haunt, and he just shipped me. And this goes to show... This is a point where Fell Hunter would have helped me secure the kill on the mage, and with the Fell Guard and no trinket up, I just sit in the sheep and basically can't do anything. So um, I still am experimenting a bit with the Fell Guard. I like him in general, but obviously versus classes like mage, you are much more uh, vulnerable to any CC effects like sheep or even Nova or any other debuffs on yourself. So. Um, this, this whole fell guard, fell hunter debate to me is not really a big question of what's better. It's just like, what do I prefer? And here I prefer to hit a paladin who I just charge and dot and he's not really doing anything. This is how the normal 1v1 scenario looks open world. I just apply my stuff and the guys just randomly die. Um, I enjoy getting kills like this. It's kind of fun to farm. And here comes the next hunter who seems to be like a bot or something because I just dot him and nothing happens and still nothing happens. I haunt him. I coil and drain life and I hope that he just dies from the dots. Meanwhile, I see a shadow priest. I just fear him as well. Um, I check if the hunter actually dies and yes, I do get the honorable kill. Um, the priest, I just haunt him and drain life him. I would have liked to charge him here, but my fell hunter is out of range. As you can see, the guy is not dispelling himself or anything. He is using dis the dispersion, but after that he's just dying, and the homunculi didn't do anything either. And I'm still tanking two mobs now as well. So, Next up is a clip where I face off against another warlock in a 1v1. He is running soul link with Felgar, the same as I am. Um, I don't play this very well, but uh, I still wanted to show you that it is possible to beat Vera matchups very, very easily. Um, I will press Coil here the same moment he does it as well. I Trinket and Fear immediately. It's another matchup where it's all about getting your Fear off first. I mean, usually Fear should be the first global, provided your opponent doesn't have a Counterspell or Charge to stop you. And then, basically, whoever gets the most Fears will likely win. Obviously, I have an advantage being Undead, but here, I mean, yeah, it's, it's just about fearing the guy, and then you usually win. Now the next topic uh, I wanted to address is the banishes. Um, obviously when you're fighting a 1v1 against a, another warlock, uh, the ideal opener is always to get a banish on the pet. Uh, just due to the fact that uh, the pet will not be able to do anything, the soul link buff 30% damage reduction will fall off, and the master demonologist will also not work. Meaning the, the warlock is kind of exposed in that situation. Similar as if you were to just kill the pet first, which would also be nice. However, there are some situations like the one that I posted in the video prior where it was just like a who can burst who down uh, first. Because obviously if I cast the banish on the pet and the guy still gets a fear off, uh, for me as an undead it's not an issue because I can just will. However, if the guy pre-casts the second fear, which I showed in my phase two videos, then I could also be screwed. Okay, I still have the insignia and I still have the bracers, so technically I should never be in fear. But um, it's it's still something to consider. Uh, fear is important. Ideally, you get him in fear, banish his pet then. This is the strategy I would recommend. Now, talking about these bracers, I wanted to make one thing clear. I mean, the tooltip is pretty clear, but I've tested this. So this is the engineering braces, which also exist for other classes. The effect on here is actually not like Will of the Forsaken that you can be feared and then go get out of fear. This works different. This is an immunity. You have to apply it similar to a fear ward. You have to apply it prior to getting feared. One more thing I wanted to talk about today is the hit chance because we had some discussions on uh, the Warlock Discord in the last days and I just wanted to clarify one thing. Um, 
I have been a classic player since WoW came out. I have always been playing Warlock. Um, I, of course, played in 2019, and since then I've been playing. And I can tell you guys, the basics of classic are pretty clear. These add-ons, these statistic add-ons have it fully correct. When I hover over hit chance, it says my affliction spell hit is 8%. Now you wonder, how can it be 8%? You only have two. And this suppression talent clearly says reduces the chances for enemies to resist by 6%. This should be something entirely different. I can tell you, no, it's not. It's exactly the same. It is spell hit. You cannot miss spells in classic. Spells can be resisted, which is essentially the same thing. They can be resisted or they can be partially resisted. This means that only some of the damage is taken. This applies to damaging spells. This doesn't apply to a spell like fear or death coil. Now, why do we even go for 8% hit? Um, the reason is pretty clear. We only need 4%. But when fighting enemies, such as Priest, we need additional hit percent to make sure our fears land. Because the Priest has a talent, I think it's the first row of the Discipline tree, I'm, I have no clue what it's called, that will reduce the chance a fear, or increase the chance a fear will resist. And we want to avoid this, so we try to go for more hit, but as I mentioned in my first video on the gear, I'm not going to put my entire gear layout for basic PvP just based on one class, right? So that's why I say, in general, we don't need any hit. This uh, suppression is uh, totally sufficient. Last but not least, I will be bringing you another clip uh, from Badlands where uh, Shadow Priest opens me, he dots me, um, he fears me. I will that immediately. My fell guard is hitting him. He silences me as well, calls all his homunculi. Mind blast me, I just shadow ward just in time to not get one shot. I decide to coil him, apply my dots, he dispersions. Getting ready to use haunt again right into the dispersion, bad on my part. I try to get fears off, you want to be getting fears off. I cannot stress this enough, this is also why metamorphosis is dog shit by the way. And you can see I'm just fearing, fearing, haunting and now here the guy is struggling to survive and the fell guard just crits him and he dies. Thanks a lot guys for tuning in, uh, wish you a great day and have a lot of fun in Season Discovery Phase 3.